This screencast covers the interior of the cell, specifically the cytoplasm. You'll find information on this topic in Chapter 3 of your textbook. The learning objectives of this screencast are as follows. Describe the cytoplasm, including organelles and inclusions. Describe the physical structure and chemical composition of the cytosol. Describe the structure and function of the following organelles, mitochondria, ribosomes, smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi complex, lysosomes, and peroxisomes, and describe the endomembrane system. If you recall, there are three major structures of the cell, the plasma membrane or cell membrane, the nucleus, and the cytoplasm, which is basically everything within the boundaries of the plasma membrane minus the nucleus. The cytoplasm is the region. So all of this is the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, we have two structures, which we're going to talk about, organelles and inclusions. And they are embedded in this clear, gelatinous, semi-solid, fluid called the cytosol. So I want you to think of the cytoplasm as like the, it's the region and the cytosol is the actual semi-solid gelatinous fluid that we find in the cytoplasm. Students often mix up the cytoplasm and the cytosol so think of it this way. If the cytoplasm uh, were a pool the cytosol would be the water in the pool. The cytosol is the intracellular fluid that surrounds all of the organelles. It represents about 55% of the total cell volume, most of which is water. So you can think of the cytosol as a solution or mixture, I should say, where water is the uh, medium in which other substances or solutes are dissolved in and they would include ions like sodium and potassium, glucose, fatty acids, proteins, amino acids, lipids, ATP of course, and various waste products. So I mentioned that in the cytoplasm you find inclusions and organelles and we're going to talk extensively about organelles in a bit uh, let's talk briefly about what inclusions are. So inclusions are organic molecules which are stored in the cytoplasm. Uh, not all cells have inclusions and the types of inclusions that you find in a cell really depend on what type uh, of cell you are um, observing. Uh, for example, fat cells, adipocytes, the, they store lots of fat. That's pretty much their function. And so in the cytoplasm of fat cells, you'll find large lipid drop, droplets. Those are inclusions. Skeletal muscle cells use glucose uh, as a source of energy to make ATP. And uh, gl uh, glucose is stored in skeletal muscles as glycogen granules. Those would be inclusions. And certain cells, such as uh, cells of the skin and hair, which are pigmented, have uh, a uh, protein called melanin uh, that gives those cells a, uh, a particular color. And so those are also uh, examples of inclusions. The other structures in the cytoplasm are the organelles. And organelles literally means little organs. They're the suspended in the cytoplasm and they basically uh, are where metabolism occurs. Different metabolic processes occur at or within these different organelles. So they allow for compartmentalization of metabolism or metabolic processes. They are the sites where various uh, cellular processes occur, uh, involved in maintenance of the cell, growth of the cell, uh, or reproduction of the cell. Many of these organelles are surrounded by a membrane that is very similar to 
the plasma membrane. This would include the mitochondria, lysosome, peroxisome, endoplasmic reticulum, both rough and smooth, as well as the Golgi apparatus. All of those organelles are what are called membrane-bound organelles. There are also other organelles that do not have membranes. Those would include the ribosomes, centrosome, centriole, and cytoskeleton. The first organelle I'd like to talk about is the mitochondrion, probably the organelle that most students are the most familiar with, and students often refer to it as the powerhouse of the cell, which it is. Uh, it's the powerhouse of the cell because it provides or produces the ATP that the cell then uses as a source of energy. Uh, the mitochondrion is specialized to use oxygen to break down organic compounds uh, for the release of energy. And that energy released from those organic compounds are captured in ATP. And this process requires oxygen uh, and is referred to as aerobic respiration. And we'll, uh, in the next uh, uh, few weeks, we'll talk extensively about aerobic respiration. But the mitochondrion is why we have to have a continuous supply of oxygen because the production of ATP uh, utilizes oxygen and that's why it's referred to as aerobic respiration. You find lots of mitochondrion in very uh, active, uh, metabolically active cells and tissues. Uh, for example, people who are like long distance runners or long distance bikers, when you look at their skeletal muscles, they are teeming with this these mitochondria. Your liver cells, which are involved in um, uh, a detoxification of substances that are uh, ingested uh, in water in your food, as well as other processes are very metabolically active and you'd find large amounts of mitochondria in your liver cells as well. Uh, and then even within the cells where there's a lot of uh, need for energy in a particular area of the cell, you'll find those mitochondria clustered in those areas. So the, the mitochondria, you really find them where there's a need for ATP or energy by the cell. If we look at the structure of the mitochondria, uh, this is a great example of anatomy or structure reflecting physiology or function. So first there is a outer membrane that separates the mitochondrion from the rest of the cytoplasm. And then there is an inner membrane and this inner membrane is thrown into these folds and we refer to these folds as cristae. And why is it folded? Well, it's folded to give it a lot of surface area. And it needs that surface area uh, in order to catalyze uh, um, the various chemical reactions that are part of uh, aerobic respiration. If we look at one of these cristae here, one of these folds, notice that they are just teeming with enzymes that catalyze the various chemical reactions involved in aerobic respiration. I also want to note that within uh, the inner membrane, we have this area that's called matrix. That matrix contains ribosomes. It also contains enzymes used in the synthesis of ATP. And it also contains mitochondrial DNA. Believe it or not, mitochondria have their own DNA. And this is DNA that's completely separate and distinct from the DNA that's in the nucleus. This DNA looks more like the circular DNA that's found in bacteria. And something else that's interesting about this, e and de, uh, this DNA, you inherit this DNA from your mother. During fertilization, 
the mitochondria in the sperm cells are destroyed. And so the only mitochondria that survive fertilization come from the egg. And so this DNA here in your mitochondria all are derived from your mother. It may seem a little weird that the mitochondria has its own DNA, and, and I mentioned that, that there are ribosomes that are found in the mitochondria, and those uh, uh, ribosomes are different from the other ribosomes that we're going to talk about that are found in the cytoplasm and found in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, it is believed that uh, an ancestor of plants and animals of today uh, was once invaded by a bacterium uh, and it became a permanent residence and gave rise to the mitochondria that we find in our uh, cells of today. Um, this is believed because, as I mentioned, the DNA in mitochondria uh, resemble the DNA in bacteria, uh, as do the uh, ribosomes. But what we also know is that the mitochondria reproduce independently of the cell. The mitochond mitochondria arise from other mitochondria. They're not produced by other organelles. So that's why it's believed that uh, the mitochondria of the day really once uh, really was uh, derived from a bacterium that got incorporated into a cell uh, and then evolved into the mitochondria that we have today. Let's now turn our attention to the ribosomes. And I'm going to use this figure here on the right to help me describe the ribosomes, what they are, where they're found, what they do. So let's talk a little bit about what you're looking at here uh, on this image. So this is the cell, and what we want to focus on is here's the nucleus here, and the nucleus is uh, separated from the rest of the cell by uh, the nuclear envelope, and that's what's shown here in purple. So we don't, even though the nucleus is not shown here, we have the nuclear envelope, which basically represents the outer boundary of the nucleus. Attached to that nuclear envelope is the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and then finally the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Notice that there are ribosomes that are attached to the outer surface of the nuclear envelope, as well as the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So what are the ribosomes? Well, the ribosomes are composed of protein and what's called ribosomal RNA. And the components of the ribosomes are actually synthesized at a specific location in the nucleus called the nucleolus. Those components of the ribosomes then pass through the nuclear pores out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And there they are assembled into complete ribosomes and either they remain free in the cytoplasm or they attach themselves to the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the outer surface of the nuclear envelope. What is the function of ribosomes? Well, it is where protein synthesis occurs. So it's where the amino acids are connected to one another to make protein. And that process is called translation. Typically, the uh, ribosomes that are free in the cytoplasm produce proteins that are going to remain in the cell and the ribosomes that are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum produce proteins that are going to be packaged and exported out of the cell. The next organelle we're going to talk about are the endoplasmic reticula or ER. An endoplasmic reticulum literally means network within the cytoplasm. If we look right outside of the nucleus, we'll find the rough and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And when you look at them together, basically they consist of interconnected fluid-filled tubules. And we call those fluid-filled tubules cisternae. What, is, what are their functions? Their functions are to transport substances within the cell. So I sort of think of them as like a 
uh, fluid field sort of subway system through the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum comes in two flavors or types. You have the rough endoplasmic reticulum and you have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Let's talk first about the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum are easily distinguishable from the smooth. They are studied with ribosomes and also they are closest to the nucleus because they're literally continuous with the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope. Um, so the ribosomes that are attached to the rough ER synthesize proteins and then that protein enters the smooth, excuse me, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And eventually, as will be described later, those proteins are destined to be secreted or exported from the cell. The rough endoplasmic reticula also are membrane factories. They are responsible for the production of the various components uh, of the plasma membrane, including phospholipids, membrane proteins, and the carbohydrate components, which are attached to those membrane proteins, making glycoproteins. This figure here sort of illustrates that process. So here is the rough ER. So you have the ribosomes shown in red here attached to the cisternae uh, of the rough in the plasma reticulum. And here you have a protein being formed. So these little purple round structures represent amino acids. Because remember, a protein is a polymer of amino acids. So we have a protein that's being produced at the ribosome. It detaches from the ribosome and then it moves within the cisternae of the uh, rough and the plasma reticulum and it's just packaged into this vesicle. And then this vesicle is transported inside the cell, typically to the Golgi apparatus or Golgi uh, complex for further processing. And now for the smooth in the plasma reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum are farther away from the nucleus uh, compared to the rough ER. Uh, typically, they extend from the rough ER, and they are more tubular in appearance, and you and they also uh, have a more of a branching structure. And of course, uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum lack ribosomes, thus the name smooth endoplasmic reticulum. When you think of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, think lipid metabolism and detoxification. Steroids, including cholesterol, steroid hormones like uh, testosterone and estrogen uh, are produced in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Fatty acids are also produced uh, in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum are also involved in the detoxification of uh, potential toxins such as alcohol, drugs, and other toxic substances. In fact, um, liver cells, uh, which are involved in, a, uh, um, in detoxification of substances, tend to have large numbers of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Also in the liver, the smooth ER are involved in the breakdown of glycogen to release glucose. Recall that glycogen is the storage form of glucose. Uh, and in certain cells, smooth ER have very specialized functions. In muscle cells, they're used to store calcium, which you'll learn later on in the semester, is involved in muscle contraction. Before we leave our discussion on the endoplasmic reticula, I thought I would just show you an image of the two. Here's the rough endoplasmic reticula here. Again, notice the, the ribosomes. Also notice how they are very, the cisternae are very flat. Compare that to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which are more tubular, more round in shape. They also branch more. And of course, they don't have the uh, the ribosomes. You can see this under the microscope as well. Here you can see the rough endoplasmic reticula versus the smooth. Our next organelle is the Golgi complex, and you can also call it the Golgi apparatus. 
it has some similarity uh, with the endoplasmic reticula in that it also consists of cisternae, these uh, tubes containing fluid. Um, the Golgi complex synthesizes carbohydrates and it receives protein from the rough endoplasmic reticulum and sort of puts, puts the finishing touches on that protein, uh, completes glycoprotein synthesis, uh, further processes those proteins and then packages those proteins for shipment, so to speak. I like to think of the Goji complex or apparatus as the UPS of uh, the sale, right? The UPS, they pack and they ship in a similar manner. The Goji apparatus has a similar function. So the Golgi complex receives newly synthesized proteins from the rough ER in these vesicles. And then when it arrives, it further processes those proteins. Sometimes it adds carbohydrate to proteins to make glycoproteins. Sometimes it adds lipids to the proteins to make lipoproteins. Sometimes it combines proteins, sorts proteins, splices and cuts proteins. Um, and then, of course, after processing these proteins, they are packaged for delivery to some location. If those proteins are going to be secreted outside of the cell, they are put in a secretory vesicle, and that vesicle then migrates to the plasma membrane, merges with the plasma membrane, and dumps its contents outside of the cell. And you know that process to be exocytosis. If, on the other hand, those proteins are plasma membrane proteins, or phospho, or their phospholipids, or other components uh, of the plasma membrane, the vesicle would merge with the plasma membrane, and in, and those proteins, phospholipids, whatever, would be incorporated into the plasma membrane. On the other hand, let's say those proteins were digestive enzymes those digestive enzymes would be packaged in a vesicle and then that vesicle would become another organelle called a lysosome. So that brings us to our next organelle which is the lysosome. Lysosomes are vesicles of enzymes, hydrolytic enzymes specifically. These are enzymes that use water to break bonds in decomposition reactions. Lysosomes basically digest organic compounds like proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, phospholipids, as well as many other substances. Um, lysosomes engage in a process called autophagy, and this is where they'll merge with worn out mitochondria and other organelles, and they'll digest those organelles. Um, the components of those organelles can then be used, or reused rather, by the cell to construct new mitochondria and organelles. In some cases, the lysosome participates in destroying the cell itself, and that process is called autolysis. Certain cells are designed to have a certain lifespan, a certain purpose, and then to destroy themselves. And the lysosome is involved in that process. In other cases, there are certain cues that tell a cell that it should 
destroy itself. Uh, if a cell is deprived of oxygen or if there is physical damage to the cell, that sometimes causes the lysosome to dump its enzymes into the cytoplasm of the cell, causing uh, destruction of the cell. For this reason, lysosomes are often referred to as suicide sacs because they can literally cause the cell to destroy itself. I might add that uh, this decision by the cell to destroy itself is not necessarily a bad thing. If you have a cell that, let's say, some mutation has occurred or there has been some defect uh, in the DNA, you would rather that cell destroy itself rather than become a cancer cell and start reproducing uh, and forming a tumor. Before moving on to the next organelle, let's talk a little bit about the interconnectedness of many of these organelles that we've discussed. That would include the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, as well as the transport and secretary vesicles from the Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum, as well as lysosomes. Collectively, the system of connected membrane-bound organelles uh, and vesicles work together to synthesize, degrade, store and export biological molecules and also to degrade harmful substances and collectively we refer to all of these uh, organelles and vesicles as the endomembrane system. The next organelles we're going to talk about are the peroxisomes and peroxisome you probably think when you hear the term peroxisomes, probably like hydrogen peroxide, uh, and there is a connection. So we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. So peroxisomes are often confused with lysosomes because they are similar in structure to lysosomes, and they also uh, contain enzymes, but they contain different enzymes. They contain what are called oxidase enzymes. And unlike lysosomes, peroxisomes are not produced by the Golgi apparatus. The function of peroxisomes is to use molecular oxygen, that's O2, to oxidize organic molecules. What's the purpose of that? Well, there are free radicals, which are basically molecules that have an um, odd number of electrons. Uh, and those um, free radicals are unstable, and they will literally break other bonds and damaged tissues. Um, and so the peroxisomes use oxygen to neutralize those free radicals. Uh, peroxisomes also detoxify alcohol, and I'm talking about like the edible alcohol that you might consume uh, in beverages, and also to detoxify other drugs and a variety of bloodborne toxins. Those are toxins that are produced naturally in your blood. Peroxisomes also participate in the breakdown of fatty acids, which can then be used by mitochondria in the production of ATP. These reactions produce hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, which is where peroxisomes get their name. Uh, that hydrogen peroxide itself is a toxin and can damage cells. And so another enzyme called catalase breaks down hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. We find peroxisomes in all cells, but we find them to be very abundant in liver and kidney cells. So I want to walk you through uh, a couple equations so that you can get a real uh, un good understanding of how peroximes, peroxisomes use oxygen to uh, detoxify and destroy free radicals. So I'm going to, I'm representing a free radical by this little RH2 with a little dot here. And what this dot represents is a uh, 
electron. So free radicals have an extra e electron, right? They're not paired with anything. And so um, this electron causes this free radical to be unstable and it will tend to want to break bonds. And that process can cause damage to other tissues of the body. So there's a enzyme called superoxide dismutase, which you produce by the peroxisome, which uses oxygen to then neutralize that free radical. So now we have a neutralized free radical. It's no longer able to, uh, to damage other molecules and therefore tissues. And hydrogen peroxide is produced in the process. Now hydrogen peroxide itself is a toxin and also can cause damage. That's why we use it as an antiseptic, an anti-organism, because you pour it on a wound and it may damage your tissues a little bit, but you hope it takes out all the bacteria or other microorganisms that, that might be in that wound. But as I was saying, this is damaging, uh, this is a toxin itself. And so there's another enzyme called catalase, which then converts that hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. And by the way, this is what is responsible for the effervescence or the bubbling that occurs when you pour hydrogen peroxide on a wound. So you pour hydrogen peroxide on the wound and it bubbles up. Why? Because there is catalase in that wound because it seeped from any of the cells that were destroyed and it basically converts that hydrogen peroxide that you pour onto the wound into water and oxygen and the effervescence is that water escaping. Now in, in no way are you expected to be able to reproduce uh, these two reactions here. I'm simply using them to illustrate how peroxisomes neutralize free radicals using oxygen and then use catalase to convert the hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. Now let's move on to talk about a few other specialized organelles as well as some extensions of the plasma membrane. Our learning objectives will be as follows. Describe the structure and function of the cytoskeleton, including its components, which include the microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Describe centrosome and centrioles. Describe the structure and function of cilia and flagella. And finally, describe the structure and function of microvilli and con contrast them with cilia in terms of their structure, their function, and their location. A lot of students overlook the cytoskeleton. It doesn't appear to be all that interesting. Uh, however, it is very, very important. Uh, it is the bones and the muscles of the cell. The cytoskeleton is composed of robbed shaped structural proteins uh, and um, the functions include determining the shape of the cell, providing structural support for the cell, thus the term bones of the cell. Uh, they also determine where the organelles are found in the cell and also they're involved in the movement of substances through the cell and if it's a mobile cell or a cell that can move, it contributes and supports the movement of the cell as well. That's why uh, I refer to the functions of the cytoskeleton, uh, referring them to the bones and muscles of the cell. As I mentioned, the cytoskeleton is composed of three rod-shaped structural proteins. And those proteins are named according to their size. We have the microfilaments, which are the smallest. We have the microtubules shown at the bottom, which are the largest. And then sort of stuck between the two uh, in, uh, of an intermediate size, we have the intermediate filaments.
except in muscle cells where the actin proteins are more or less permanent in most cells these microfilaments break down and then reform and as they break down and reform they cause movement these microfilaments are responsible for example for the cleavage furrow that forms uh, toward the end of mitosis, which eventually leads to the separation of the cytoplasm of a cell to form two new cells doing cytokinesis. The microfilaments are often attached to adhesion molecules, which then allow the cell to move in sort of a creeping amoeboid type fashion. And these microfilaments are responsible for changes in the membrane during exocytosis and endocytosis as vesicles form from the membrane or vesicles merge with the membrane during exocytosis. Intermediate filaments are interme intermediate in size uh, and they are less flexible than the microfilaments these are the structures that participate in junctions, such as the desmosomes, where uh, one cell is anchored to an adjacent cell. In this figure, which is from another book, you can see the desmosomes here, those anchoring ju junctions between cells, right? And you can notice the intermediate filaments. Also notice the intermediate filaments that spread throughout the cell. Here's another group of intermediate filaments here. The final and largest component of the cytoskeleton are the microtubules. Microtubules are composed of the protein tubulin. Microtubules determine the overall shape of a cell. They also allow movement of organelles within the cell. And as you will see shortly, they're involved in the formation of flagella and cilia. If we look a little more closely, we'll see that the microtubules are composed of 13 strands. If you counted them around the circumference here, you'd note there are 13 strands of these globular proteins called tubulin. Going back to the figure that we were looking at earlier, notice that the microtubules are radiating out from the central location. The central location here is called the centrosome. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But you can see how by radiating out like this, it's almost like they are, I sort of think of them as like arms reaching out and holding up the plasma membrane, right? Uh, accounting for determining the shape of the cell and providing structural support for the overall cell. So I mentioned that microtubules support the movement of organelles within the cell. Uh, and this is be, uh, and, and how they do this is think of them as prov providing sort of like the track along which organelles move. In this example, we have a vesicle. That's our organelle. And that vesicle is connected to what are called motor proteins. And those motor proteins are proteins that, that literally move. And so that vesicle moves through the cytoplasm by using those motor proteins to literally sort of walk along this microtubule. So when we were looking at exocytosis and endocytosis, we talked about how vesicles migrate to or from the plasma membrane. Well, they don't do that magically. They're attached to motor proteins, which then are attached to these microtubules, and they allow for movement of those vesicles within the cell. Our final organelle is the centriole, and you saw the centriole when we were looking at mitosis and cytokinesis in lab. So the centriole is composed of 
microtubules arranged in nine what are called triplets or three microtubules. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And each of those triplets is connected by a little uh, non-tubulin protein link. You can find the centrioles in the centrosome. There's that centrosome again. Uh, I introduced you to the centrosome when we, were, when we discussed uh, the microtubules, uh, saying that they radiate out from the centrosome. So what is the centrosome? Well, the centrosome is basically the organizing area for microtubules. So the microtubules sort of are generated at the centrosome. Also, the centrosome is involved in the production of mitotic spindle during my mitosis. You can think of the centrosome as the site where all of the components of the cytoplasm are organized. Going back to the centrioles, the centrioles are the organelles that are found in the centrosome that are composed of microtubules. So please do not confuse the microtubules for the, for the centrosome. The centrosome is an area where the components of the cytoskeleton are organized. The centrioles are the actual organelles here that are composed of the triplets of microtubules. Centrioles form cilia and flagella. So the centriole basically forms the base or what's referred to as the basal body of cilia and flagella. If we look at um, what's called an axoneme, and basically what sprouts from the uh, centriole. Notice it looks very similar to uh, a centriole. Uh, the only difference is instead of having a triplet, we only have a, we only have two. So imagine starting with that centriole and then having two of the three microtubules of the triplets extend and that is the beginning of your cilium or flagellum. So you might be a bit confused about how centrioles form cilia and flagella since we haven't talked about those structures yet. So let's do that now. So cilia, cilium being singular, are whip-like structures that extend from the plasma membranes of some cells. Certainly, uh, most cells do not have cilia, uh, but some do. And cilia come in two forms. You have non-modal cilia. It's basically cilia that don't move. Uh, they serve as sensory structures detecting changes. There are also what are called motile cilia. And motile cilia, they do move, and their function is to move substances across the cell surface. Let's look at each of these types of cilia. So non-modal cilia are used to as receptors to detect changes. Some places you can find that these non-modal cilia would be in your inner ear, retina, nasal cavity, kidney. Uh, I just wanted to sort of illustrate these uh, non-modal cilia by looking at um, the roof of your nasal cavity. So this is a uh, sagittal section of the nasal cavity. Notice at the roof of your nasal cavity, you have what are called olfactory receptors. They are responsible for smell. Well, how do they do that? Well, when you breathe air in, molecules in that air get stuck in this layer of mucus, and you have these olfactory hairs or cilia that are responsible for detecting those molecules and then sending nerve impulses 
to your brain, where your brain then interprets um, those molecules, and that's what's responsible for smell. I will assume that people who get COVID-19, or at least the alpha and the delta variants, uh, lose their sense of smell either due to some change in these olfactory receptor cells or destruction of these olfactory receptor cells leading to uh, loss of smell. Not exactly sure if, if it's just uh, it, it just somehow makes them unable to detect and respond or if there's actually cell uh, destruction. The cilia that most people are more familiar with are the modal cilia. These are cilia that actually move uh, and they beat. You'll find them in the respiratory tract, uterine tubes, uh, ventricles, ventricles of the brain, and ducts of the testes. And this uh, particular uh, figure, or I should say image, uh, is taken from the trachea. Trachea is your windpipe. Air moves down the trachea towards your lungs and it's lined with mucus to capture all the little nasties that are in the air you breathe, bacteria, mold spores, dust particles, etc. What these cilia do is, uh, as dust particles get caught in the layer of mucus, they beat away from the lungs to move all those little nasties away from your lungs, so with the hope that they never reach your lungs. So this figure from your book sort of illustrates what I just described. You have this layer of mucus, that actually is found on top of this layer of saline secreted by cells of the trachea. And what happens is these um, cilia beat, they'll stroke to the right and then recover to the left, stroke to the right, recover to the left, stroke to the right, recover to the left, and that those sequential um, stroke and recovery recovery uh, motions move substances across the surface of the cells, which is the function of multiple cilia, to move substances across the surface of the cell. I thought I'd point the following out. It's certainly not something that you that you're expected to know for a quiz or exam, but I mentioned that you have this layer of saline. This layer of saline solution is very important because what actually happens is this mucus sort of sort of uh, moves on top of that layer of saline. These underlying cells pump out sodium and chloride and of course water. And that's what provides this little saline layer here. And then the mucus rides on top of it. People who have cystic fibrosis are missing those very important pumps. So that mucus is sort of, uh, doesn't it, rather than riding on top of this uh, layer of saline, it sort of rests between and on top of the cilia, and so it makes it very difficult for the cilia to mobilize uh, the mucus and move it through and move it around. Um, people with uh, cystic fibrosis will, t will tend to accumulate this mucus uh, in their lungs. Also, uh, smoking destroys the cilia, principally because of the nicotine in cigarette smoke. I mentioned earlier that the cilia are formed by centrioles. The centrioles form the base or basal body of the cilia, and then two of the three microtubules from every triplet then extends, and that's what forms the cilia as they literally sprout through the cytoplasm. The centriole sort of implants itself below the, below the plasma membrane, and then the uh, 
cilium grows from the basal body and extends through the plasma membrane. Flagella are formed by centrioles in a similar fashion. The only difference is um, that with cilia, you're talking about many structures. Flagella, you're only talking about one, and it's much longer and also uh, is stiffened by coarse fibers. Flagella are used differently compared to cilia. Flagella have more of a whipping motion and that propels a cell forward. You can think of it almost like a flipper on like the tail fin of a fish or a dolphin and it propels them for forward. Uh, flagella move the cell. Cilia move substances across the surface of the cell. So their functions are different though their structures are similar. Um, sperm are the only human cells that have flagella. So we've talked about flagella and we've also talked about cilia, which are extensions from the plasma membrane. Let's complete our discussion of these structures by now talking about microvilli. Microvilli look similar to cilia but they are very different in terms of their structure and certainly different in terms of their functions. So the microvilli are basically modifications of the plasma membrane where the, where the plasma membrane are thrown into these like little finger-like projections. The purpose is to increase surface area for absorption. The microvilli are often referred to as a brush border because they literally look like the bristles on a brush. It is very common for students to mix up cilia and microvilli because they do look somewhat similar. Just remember that their functions are very different and therefore where you find them in the body are very different as well. Cilia, at least the modal cilia, are designed to move substances across the surface of a cell. You'll find them in areas like uh, the trachea or windpipe. You'll find them lining um, cavities in the central nervous system where they are responsible for moving cerebral spinal fluid. You'll also find them in uterine tubes, what's also known as fallopian tubes because they help move the egg cell or ovum from the ovary down toward the uterus. So their function is to move substances across the surface of the cell. Microvilli, on the other hand, they are designed to increase surface area for absorption. Uh, one of the places you'll find microvilli are in the small intestine where most absorption of nutrients occurs. We covered quite a bit in the screencast, so let's review the learning objectives. Describe the cytoplasm, including organelles and inclusions. Describe the physical structure and chemical composition of the cytosol. Describe the structure and function of the following organelles, mitochondria, ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, both smooth and rough, Golgi complex, lysosomes, and peroxisomes. Describe the endomembrane system. Describe the structure and function of the cytoskeleton, including its components, the microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Describe centrosome and centrioles. Describe the structure and function of cilia and flagella. And finally, describe the structure and function of microvilli and contrast them with cilia in terms of structure, function, and location. And but even even but that's all, folks.